the sixth network book forum in our series, Spotlighting Experiments of the Mind by Emily Martin. I'm Emmanuel Moss. I'm a joint postdoctoral scholar here at Data and Society and at Cornell Tech. And I'm here with Dr. Noel Stout, who spent 10 years at NYU in the same department as Emily, and who is now a research faculty at Apple University. And with Reiti uh, Akiriade, um, who is on the health and data team here at Data and Society. Um, I will be your host alongside my colleagues, uh, Nazli and Rigo, who are pulling levers and flipping switches behind the curtain. Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. Data and Society began in New York City, an island node in a large, large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic North, Northeast uh, on the ancestral land of the Lenape Lenape people. Today, we're connected online via a different network a vast array of servers, humans, and computers. In the US, much of this system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. We commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. Experiments of the Mind, from the Cognitive Psychology Lab to the world of Facebook and Twitter, is a new book by Dr. Martin that explores the extent to which cognitive psychology research is a hidden force in our online lives. In the book, Emily traces how psycholo psychological research methods evolve, uh, evolved and escaped the boundaries of the discipline and infiltrated social media and our digital universe. Um, she does this by recounting her participation in research labs to demonstrate how, despite claims of experimental psychology's focus on isolated individuals, its research methods are in Act highly social. She then follows these methods from the lab to the online services with which we are now intimately familiar. She shows how these methods are amplified by troves of data and powerful machine learning in which statistical measures are paired with algorithms to predict and influence users' behavior. It's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Martin to say a few words about her book before I bring in the rest of our esteemed panel for a conversation amongst the four of us. After that, we'll turn it over to you in the audience for some Q&A. So please join me in welcoming Emily. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Manny, uh, very much. And let me start by saying how grateful I am to Data and Society. Uh, they, they are, you are, kind of the most perfect audience for what I have been working on uh, that I could imagine. So the organizers and panelists, I really thank for this opportunity. So the, the backstory of this book is that my original goal was a rather mundane one. It was to do just another sort of science, science studies treatment of a science for which the, this had not yet been done, experimental psychology, which struck me as an important one to look at that way um, because of its pervasiveness in our lives, uh, though we may not always realize it. And it's very wide audience. Um, among other things, because it's often a, a uh, required course in college and uh, high school. So I wondered, given its pervasiveness and influence, what, what's going on in those labs? How do they produce these facts that come out and appear in textbooks and are taught in classes? Um, what, how on earth do you produce objective facts from uh, human beings who are quintessentially always in the midst of subjective experiences, how do you rest out from that bunch of subjective experience um, facts that could be called objective, which is what psychologists um, apparently do, but how? So uh, being a cultural anthropologist, I just you know figured, well, if you wanna know what they're doing, you've gotta go join them and um, hang out with them and you know, see what they're doing on a daily basis, not what they say they're doing, but what they are actually doing. So I was able to be uh, an ethnographer, a fly on the wall sort of uh, thing in three uh, labs um, on both the West Coast and the East Coast of the US. And I just did traditional standard participant observation. I went to all the meetings, sat in on lab meetings, went to social events, uh, interviewed lab members, learned how to do some simple um, procedures myself, 
uh, went to the scientific conferences that they go to and so on. And uh, this went on for a number of years. So using that material, I thought, well, I've got a grip on this discipline as a, as a science. And I wrote the first nine chapters of the book, which was a kind of science studies thing. Um, how do they do what they're doing and how do they make the facts that they um, produce? Um, I sent it to a publisher and, and there were two peer reviewers to ask for their opinion. The first peer reviewers said, oh, yay. They were so happy to finally see a study of psychology, experimental psychology as, as a you know, science studies way what goes on behind the scenes, what's going on in the labs. And it hadn't been done before and they were just ecstatic to see um, this work. In particular, how, how the discipline which sees itself as describing individual subjects, the subject is always an individual. And my interest was in um, the interleaving of that effort with very social, communal, collective activities, which I would argue are necessary for the pursuit of being able to see the subject as an individual. Um, things like needing mutual help to conduct experiments. So you can't do them all alone. You need other lab members to help you. And how do you get them willing to help you? Well, you have lots and lots and lots of social events, potlucks and shared cookies and cupcakes and go to movies and um, festivals around the city and have build a sense of culture collective interest and, and mutual um, dependence. So that, uh, that was uh, also um, <laughs> uh, I uh, realized that among the social events that they were very prone to um, hold, there were also many subjective judgments being made all the time that enabled the quantitative objective measures to be taken. And uh, one way I think about this sign, this presence of the social in what appears to be individual actions is kind of like what's called the mark of the hand in the, in the digital. This is a slide of uh, Google digitalizing books. And someone had the wit to realize that to digitalize a book, to produce quantitative digital data, um, Hand, human hands are necessary. They have to be there holding the book, holding it steady, turning the pages. And so this has uh, been called the mark of the hand. So that was uh, one, whoops, one um, response to um, peer reviewing the book. The other reviewers said, no, don't publish it. This is terrible. Uh, who cares, he said, who cares about all this detail about the psychology lab? Um, it's just too narrow and too uninteresting to anybody else and basically is not publishable, um, which kind of threw me, but um, worse things have happened to me. So I just kept thinking and going along. And then I came upon a reference that the founders of several social media um, platforms like Uber and Facebook had actually attended a, an experimental psychology course taught by B.J. Fogg at Stanford. And this was a clue, a link between what I had looked at in experimental psychology labs and what was going on in social media. And um, it gave me the kind of gasoline to keep on um, looking into this. And this is, this is the book that they had read, the B.J. Fogg book. And I was um, inspired um, by a book called A Prehistory of the Cloud by Hu Dongwei, um, in which he shows the, that the brand new digital opt uh, fiber optic cables all over the country are actually laid down along the lines of old railroad tracks. So I thought, well, that's completely fascinating, something so new and shiny and digital and you know, out of the cloud is using the infrastructure from something really old, railroads. And that gave me a way of, think, of understanding or kind of describing what I was trying to do with the psychological experimentation work, that it lies like a kind of like an old fashioned railroad bed underneath the shiny new uh, sparkling things that social media can do. Uh, and so um, 
that was one of the main impetuses for the book. Um, the, the other uh, things that I uh, stress was to look carefully at how it is that uh, we are so willing and eager to perform exercises on like rating the quality of a commodity or a service, filling out questionnaires, checking our status on Facebook, the willingness with which people pour their personal data into social media platforms. Um, and although these actions are not really exactly like being in an experiment, there are some elements that they share with experiments, namely the choices that you have to uh, register your approval or disapproval are determined in advance by others. And then they're analyzed uh, statistically, meaning quantitatively. Uh, so you, you don't get to say to Twitter, um, I really don't like the way you've organized, your, you know, and go on for three or four paragraphs about your own personal take on why you don't like this or that on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. You have to just check um, a like or unlike, or maybe a, a scalar um, measure. And that struck me as uh, a very important aspect of um, how we are asked to participate. And it implies that we are made into subjects, we are willingly made into subjects, who uh, are kind of optimized to fit the responses that are required uh, on social media. Uh, and this uh, led me to kind of draw a line between um, what we're called upon to do in social media questionnaires and so on, um, namely pay attention, sit still, uh, don't ask questions back, don't, don't question the questions, don't question the question, questioner, just respond, just be a good subject. And that's exactly what happens in psychological experiments. You may get a short period of training, but you do have to be willing to sit still in front of a computer for, until the task is over and be a kind of uh, optimized human subject. Um, and so this, this kind of disciplining of the potential social media subject, um, I began to understand as uh, a kind of engine in the sense that um, Mackenzie uh, describes in his book, a camera, uh, an engine on a camera, uh, that something that lies a little bit hidden underneath daily life, um, but serves to propel certain kinds of responses without our necessarily being aware of it. And uh, so we don't see that engine, the form of the psychological experiment, though it is very present and powerfully present uh, underneath the lively activities that go on in social media. So in short, that's what the book is about. Thank you, Emily, so much for sharing that. I uh, really appreciate the, uh, the backstory as well as like the trials and tribulations along the way, um, because um, you, don't, you don't always see those when you have the finished product in your hands. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing those with us. Um, we're going to have a panel discussion now. I'm going to take a uh, host initiative and ask the first question, um, but I want to encourage uh, Noel and Ireti to, to follow up um, and have this be more of a conversation. Um, but certainly also to take the opportunity to ask questions of Emily as well. Um, so for me, reading your book, I was struck by how psychology appears as the study of subjectivity at scale. So much of the laboratory work you describe is attempting to locate that distance between subjective experience um, on the one hand and what can be objectively demonstrated about cognitive processes uh, based on subjective experiences, on the other hand. Um, and the latter part of your book suggests an equally important project uh, is currently needed to locate the distance between subjective experience and objective claims in datafied and digital processes in these online social media um, domains that we find ourselves in. So I guess the first part of my question is how you see the tension or interplay between subjectivity and objectivity in your own work. Um, writ large or, or through this book specifically. Um, and the second part is what you think of social media as, as an experimental apparatus and whether it has the kind of affordances required to delve into that distance between subjective experience and more objective descriptions of reality. 
or maybe there's another way that you're thinking about the, this that's kind of sideways to the way I'm describing it. So feel free to, to reshape my question uh, as you see fit. Well, thank you for a really stimulating, thought-provoking question, Manny. Um, <laughs> I guess I would say that um, the, the closest that my research uh, got to engaging with this issue of how does how does the subjective appear here in, alongside or in, uh, in tandem with the, the objective? Uh, and the sh to me, it was very shocking to find this, although I don't, goodness knows why I was so shocked, but it's the um, fact that in an experiment, in the lab, in the experimental uh, situation, the uh, subjects are trained before they engage in an experiment and they're actually trained and I just couldn't get over this. I thought this was so amazing. How, how could you imagine that you're kind of dipping into the pond and seeing what organisms might lie there when, when you, you know, as it were, you've been giving lectures to the creatures in the pond about how to behave. <laughs> and it seemed a little bit uh, contradictory to me to, to have practice before an experiment. Um, it turns out that, um, uh, you know, uh, we, we maybe don't even need practice when it comes to things on social media because we're so, we've been already so trained up to participate. But what I think is important is to see um, those ways in, uh, Wittgenstein calls it an Einbrechtsten, which is a phrase that can be used to train a dog in a nice way, not cruelly, but to repeat a certain behaviors over and over until the dog learns to, come when called or to bring the ball back or whatever it might be. And I think it's worth really thinking about to what extent have we been um, offered and accepted and Ein Abrechtsen for um, participating in social media. Um, you know, I just think of like uh, in, this, in, in airports, whatever, wherever you are in, in an airport, you might see a big poster that says, how have you enjoyed your stay in uh, LaGuardia today? And then there's four buttons, you know, I like it a lot and then the middle and then that. And you, what I want for us is to think, hey, I have a different question. I don't, I don't wanna feed my data into your pre-given pre question. I wanna talk to somebody uh, about the seats being too short or the ice cream being not cold enough or whatever it might be. Um, to break out of the mold that's the given choice of questions and find out what you, and one of your questions you called it, um, ground truth. Ground truth, I would say, is requires opening the door to letting people express in their own words, taking a bit more time, it's not quick, and um, it's not necessarily easy, easy to quantify. Um, but, that, but those are the things that I, look, I would look for, uh, places that are not, fully made into a choice between three responses, but have some wiggle room around them. Um, so, and, and the other last quickly thing I would say is that in a way your question points to possible fieldwork projects, uh, which I would say I have not done. Um, in, in the book, I kind of realize that this, area of social media and digital media is where I need to be to go to look, but I only got as far as looking uh, down at it from a big high cliff and, and trying to see what I could see in a kind of um, rather cursory and sh shallow way without doing real field work. And yet I think there are opportunities to do um, more, much more in depth and detailed um, field work about why people are willing to give their data, why they submit to these forms of discipline, um, what are the ethical guideposts, as I know you've written about, uh, it seems like an entry point for some very meaningful field work to answer some of your questions. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Emily. Um, I think that's a perfect lead in to my question about the kinds of distinctions between the research for the labs and then thinking about social media. Um, 
But before I get there, I just have to say this is probably the best story of the horrible reviewer number two turning into <laughs> something positive, taking the, the jerk who's reviewer number two and then making it into something that's so meaningful for the rest of us. So that's a thank you for that. Um, I just have to say too, I think that you know this book is so incredible. It's so consequential, but yet so intimate. Um, and the way that you address the production of the individual, this foundational myth of our society, and show how it actually comes about through this highly social and subjective process is just so generative and fascinating. Um, and it's still such a pleasure to read. You have this, these incredible moments of reflexivity. So I, I just, I just am a huge fan of this book. Um, and and I, and as you were saying that you, you know, you described as kind of being up on a cliff looking down and there is a real distinction between the intimacy that you form in the labs and then how we're thinking about tech. And this could be for obvious reasons, it's hard to gain access. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, if we, if we assume the same kinds of dynamics exist in the, in tech and on these tech teams as they do in the lab so that, you know, we have deeply interconnected social groups, effective ties that outshine professional agendas, um, reflexivity, doubt, um, you know, really smart people who are working on hard problems, trade-offs with technology. I wonder if that changes how we judge the outcome at all. Um, you know, I think that it's oftentimes easy, at least for me before I started at Apple, um, I had a certain preconception of what people would be like but it turns out they're just like us. <laughs> like they're just, they're critical and they're smart and they're, you know, progressive. And, and so um, I think in a sense, it, it makes it a harder question then because it would be easier to say, okay, it makes sense. They're a certain kind of person. And that's why they're, you know, people are creating certain products, not necessarily at Apple, but, you know, these kind of data-driven extraction projects um, in tech. But if that's not the case, and in fact, they are very well-intentioned, then we're dealing with more of unintended consequences. And so just to get kind of your, you know, your thinking on that as a next step, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. diving a little deeper into these different mm -hmm. scenes ethnographically. Oh, that's such a wonderful, thank you for the compliments. Uh, uh, obviously, I mutually appreciate all your work uh, very much indeed. Um, so that's just a really thought-provoking question. And my when I, well, my first response is um, digital media has been blamed for a lot of bad things. It's been blamed for like in coded, coded bias, uh, the film and the interviews with Joy Bula, Winnie, um, you know, all the racist presuppositions that sneak in um, into the data, um, digital data, and um, oh, there's another phrase from Deborah Raji: "How data encodes systematic racism." This is this is the kind of thing. So um, it, it's not that that is wrong at all. It's that if you think of these things as collectively produced through these sorts of very subtle social processes, instead of being produced by bad individuals who just have bad attitudes and, and so on. It's, it's a very different picture. And, it, and it's actually a harder picture to figure out, you know, what might happen next, what might be, make, make things better. Because if it's not uh, a few bad apples or a few misguided individuals, but rather a collective process that draws on a kind of general culture of ideas and attitudes, um, then, uh, and I think that recent uh, actual incidents in the in the U.S. Um, from the Buffalo shootings to the um, well, I don't want to name too many, but the recent uh, incidents that um, we've all had to, or Americans anyway, have had to live through in a very close quarters, the pervasive influence of replacement theory, this this kind of thing. Um, is the cultural context out of which these um, attitudes that get into digital media, as well as everything else, could be coming uh, and probably are coming. And so um, I guess my response would be to hope that, you know, Lucy Suchman once said that when we look at digital data, 
we're looking or about anybody or anything or any process, we're looking through a very tiny keyhole. We only see a tiny bit of what is fully out there if we could get access to it. So my hope would be that if we could find a broader context to see the actions and attitudes of people who have racist, say racist, for example, or misogynistic or a classist or whatever, beliefs we could broaden the context, not have just a tiny keyhole, but a bigger context in which to understand what background conditions have led them to feel this way, to have these beliefs. And that would be, um, you know, hard to do, but um, potentially it could have some force. Uh, I hope it's okay if I jump in here with my question. Um, but first, I wanted to start by saying thank you so much for having me on this panel, Manny, and I'm so excited to be a part of this. Um, so what I really liked about this book is how you show that like the social media algorithms and artificial intelligence and machine learning are both materially and epistemologically connected to the practices of the experimental cognitive psychology lab not just in terms of the subject, which is human cognition, but in terms of how they understand the subject and produce knowledge about the human subject, namely viewing and training people to act as quantifiable, optimizable machinery, mm -hmm. uh, which is useful for understanding what happens when psychology is intentionally analyzing digital biomarkers for either research purposes or clinical purposes. Um, but what I really like about this book is that you do this while showing through your personal narrative the concrete ways that an anthropologist differs from an experimental psychologist in viewing the human. And it kind of left me with that specific difference, or those specific differences are particularly important for understanding the range of problems or experimental limitations that emerge when trying to layer machine learning over cognitive behavioral analysis to understand people. Um, so I received training in experimental psychology and worked as a research assistant in a social psychology lab, um, as well as as a research participant and a research subject. And what you talk about in this book, like this feeling of an inability to convey nuance and convey your subjective experience is something that I definitely felt as a participant in these studies. Um, so I am particularly interested in hearing about that experience and how it kind of teaches you or allowed you to see um, how when transporting the experimental psychology lab to digital spaces, either social networking sites or cognitive and behavioral health platforms with the explicit psychological or psychiatric aim, um, does the digital environment, which drastically increases scale and can utilize machine learning and artificial intelligence, does that digital environment help bring light to some of the oversights that a classic psychology lab can't attend to? And then because of the strong connection between the two domains, I'm not so sure, but if so, um, what do researchers need to change when taking the model from the experimental psychology lab to perform cognitive behavioral analysis using smartphones and other personal digital devices? Oh, thank you. That's a really rich and provocative question, a series of questions. Um, I'm not too optimistic <laughs> about uh, the frameworks that you mentioned, um, AI, machine learning, and um, you've been a participant in these situations and you've worked in them, so you, you know them well. And um, when I, uh, one of my fieldwork techniques was to, oh, to, to frequently ask the psychologists, um, why can't you do it differently? Because I would say it seems to me there's a problem here. You're, you're, you know, you're getting a certain kind of very narrow data. People are so confined in what they can say. Are you really understanding human psychology in a in a rich and good way, or are you boxing people in to only be able to produce certain kinds of data? And is there any other way to do it? Um, and <laughs> Uh, they would say, well, I could become an anthropologist, I guess, and um, not, not a serious suggestion, but uh, they would say, well, suppose instead of um, having subjects come into a lab and answer questions on the computer, suppose I go, this is the psychologist, suppose I go into a coffee shop and where there are people drinking coffee and having scones and stuff, 
And I tried to capture something about what their intentions are, their goals, their attitudes, something psychological. How on earth would I, you know, I just can't be done. There's no framework for it. Nothing is comparable to anything else. It's all different people, different settings. So they immediately saw the strength of the experimental method and its and the way it confines them as investigators. Um, and you know, they would there was sort of a humorous uh a well kind of response to my questioning about if they could use a different method. Um, and so I think I feel that once having accepted the, ten the framework of the field, it's kind of like um, Wittgenstein talked about the banks of a stream. If the stream of water is like the life we're living, um, the experiment is like the banks of this stream and the stream is confined by the banks. It's the framework of our knowledge. And so when you enter a discipline with rather strict and very well articulated banks, so to speak, um, you have to give up a lot in order to get that particular kind of data. So I, I, I tried very hard not, because I was told by the um, PIs of the labs, I must not make them look bad. That was my thing I had to promise. So instead of making them look bad, I made me look bad by uh, framing the book around mistakes I made, things I misunderstood, things I got all garbled up. And so in each of those incidents reveals something about the way things are supposed to be. So um, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it, it's a trick to work in a sympathetic way with a science that by its own account is um, has rather strict and severe restrictions on what can be what kind of data can be collected. I'd love to pick up on this thread of thinking about methodology, Emily, because that's very much um, what what you were just discuss, discussing in your in your last comment. Um, because we've got more than more than two anthropologists in the in the conversation, so um, I guess what I want to ask is that. Um, in the book, you, uh, in, in addition to like, um, you know, you deploying these kinds of questions deliberately and these kinds of framings that you were just mentioning, um, you do talk about the scientists themselves as almost like anthropologists themselves at various moments where they're speaking really reflectively about their own practices, um, and start to open up to the broader sociocultural implications of their work. And having done, having done some ethnography myself, those moments are so golden, um, but they don't strike me in your book as being happy accidents or having just gotten lucky with a particular um, uh, character you happen to be working amongst. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about how you think you get to those moments in your fieldwork for this book, but also generally over the course of your career. Like, how does the groundwork get laid for those kinds of moments? Um, and, and Noelle, you've done some fieldwork as well. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Um, as well. Well, um, first of all, thank you for the question. That's a that's a, just a gigantic compliment. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that that's kind of the idealization of field work that you would get into a relationship with people so they would accept the value of your project and help you. Uh, how does it happen? It doesn't always happen, as probably every field worker on Earth could. Uh, testify that sometimes it really doesn't work and you you just you either don't get access or people aren't just aren't forthcoming enough to help help you with your project in this case uh, apart from there was luck I mean there really really was luck in that the first person that opened some doors to me felt that the project was very valuable and ought to be done and was a history a follower of the history of his discipline so I, that piece of luck, I then used um, this, this insight that some psychologists are really interested in the history of their discipline, where it came from. How did it come to be a discipline of science and where, what was it before? So I used that all the time. I, I would bring in texts from the early days where you could see that psychology and anthropology were really not that different and ask them to talk about the, 
the, how the two disciplines parted ways and you know stuff like that opened up a much broader canvas of uh, questions about what they're doing in their labs in particular today. Um, I think that in like if I were to make a really broad generalization, it's it, this is, reflects Noel's work that is that um, people aren't often asked in detail, what is your work? What is it that you actually do? I mean, we say, what do you do? And we wanna hear, oh, I'm a computer scientist or I'm a, an anthropologist, that's what we hear. But no, no, I mean, what do you actually do on a daily basis when you go into the office and when you go out to do a study, what is it? The people really like to be asked that question. If, if the person really wants to hear the answer. And, and so I've traded on that quirky aspect of the uh, kind of hidden world of what work or what any kind of work actually in, involves to get people to talk about the details of their working lives. And, you know, this is commonplace for any field worker um, showing up, putting in the hours. Um, uh, being willing to participate, to help, to show up when extra hands are needed, um, learning techniques and doing, I mean, mine were pathetically little, but I could, I could help now and then with experiments. But the willingness to help, I think, more than the actual ability to do a ton of stuff is what matters. And it's building social relationships, big surprise, you know, um, if you, if you can, get people to appreciate the goals you have and to care about them because they care about you a little bit, then you have um, a sort of sort of team on the, on the project that you could um, turn to for new questions, other questions. So, so I, I don't know, it, it's, it's somebody once said that a good, a good field worker is like a um, magnetized bar of metal that goes out into the world and 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 lines up things magnetically, and um, it's not that they weren't lined up, but it's that the field worker kind of sees the structures or patterns or repeated themes in a in a way that they don't just make themselves obviously apparent without that kind of insight. And all all of us who are anthropologists do that in one way or another. Um, it's a bit mysterious, <laughs> but that's the discipline. Yeah, I would love to just, I can quickly just say, I found the same thing. So my um, last project, uh, part of it entailed interviewing uh, bank employees who are working for major lenders who were denying mortgage modification appeals. Um, and people were no one had ever asked them how they felt about doing this work. And so it did open up a lot of new, you know, insight, I would say, and a kind of sense of relief. It became a kind of confessional about how people felt about being in the gory belly of this bureaucracy. So I um, completely agree with that. And Emily, I'm, I'm curious as a follow-up to this and thinking about, you know, you kind of describe the narrative technique of showing of being kind of the bumbling anthropologist and we learn alongside you, which is a trope within anthropology. Usually it's the first, the opening vignette, right? Where the anthropologist <laughs> makes a mistake and then learns some important <laughs> lesson. Um, but you you carry us through with that kind of, you know, technique throughout. It's And it's very compelling. It You know, it's really endearing, I would say. Um, as a narrator, we come to trust you and feel like we're there with you. And But I also was really impressed by how it, created this sense that this the knowledge that you were producing as the scholar was also social and collective, that you weren't the lone ethnographer coming back from the field with these brilliant insights that that your you know participants wouldn't have recognized. But it was a collective endeavor to create this knowledge. It was, you know, and it was so social. And it was, you know, at times you agree with them, at times you took on their perspective, even when they were being reflexive and you had kind of started to assume that what they were saying was true or right. Um, and I, I wonder, was that, part, was that part of your thinking? Was that intentional? Or is that something that just kind of grew organically out of the, the process, a happy accident? Uh, great question. Um, it, it came out of being told I couldn't make them look bad. It came out of that 
eat it. And I and they actually made me promise, like in words, I had to actually say, uh, I will, I promise I will not make you look bad. And so that that was a big heavy frame. Um, and so now what are you gonna do? Because you certainly don't wanna, you know, do a kind of uh, uh, put golden guilt over the whole thing and say how great the science is and all that. So that was my solution to that, that very strict edict that I was put under. Um, but I, I guess, as you were asking the question, I thought, well, I guess one of the risks of doing that, of saying, of, of framing the story around things I didn't understand and mistakes I made, is that you might become a very unreliable narrator. I mean, you, you might have to give up your, uh, your ability to speak knowledgeably about about what's going on here. Um, and I guess that's a risk that you take when you, when you uh, adopt that narrative strategy, at, which I think it absolutely is a narrative strategy. Um, so uh, it can't, uh, also another part of, the, of my thoughts in answering your question is that uh, some of my main interlocutors turned out to be just these geniuses uh, at answering my questions, even before I knew they were my questions. And uh, the, one of them, which, which I quote at great length, was the one who said, in, in response to some question I asked, well, human, we've made people into different kinds of people. Look at what we've done. We have them sit emotionless in front of a computer and pick, you know, pre-select questions and then we chat. And so we've made people into, we've optimized the subject. I mean, one of my interlocutors actually said that we've optimized the subject. We've made people into different kinds of people. And I really couldn't believe he said that. I mean, I just was agog because I wouldn't have dared say that. That was to, to my mind too critical, uh, but given my edict of not making them look bad. But he goes and says it, so that's now in the in the data, and I can I can repeat it. Thank goodness. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how it, I really do think that the group of people that I found were especially interested in the history of their discipline, and from that flowed op openness to questioning the assumptions that you know came from somewhere else, moved and developed over time, and now they're present in the lab, but they have a history. So therefore they were once different and they emerged from some conditions to be what they are today. So I just think that was hugely lucky. Great, thanks. It's, it's a very feminist kind of approach, I think, to science to yeah. show how that's created through these interactions. It's really yeah. lovely, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that reflection from, from both of you, actually. Um, I want to flag that we have some time for a Q&A from the audience. Um, so I'd encourage uh, everybody out there in Radioland to uh, uh, type a question into the Q&A function um, if you have one, um, because I love hearing Emily's answers to thoughtful questions. I want to ask her as many as possible. Um, and and while, that, while that queue is, uh, is filling up, hopefully, um, I guess I... I've taken seriously the kind of image you've painted, Emily, of um, your work coming up to this cliff and looking over at all of these things. And I don't know why I imagine that cliff as uh, overlooking a beach uh, for some reason, but that's the kind of cliff I picture when you describe it. Um, and there are all sorts of like interesting critters down there on the beach. There's <laughs> seashells and crabs and kelp. Um, and, you know, sunbathers, there's all sorts of things down there that are interesting. And I'd be really curious um, to hear, like, where, 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 where do you think we should be taking our, our little, our little beach shovels or our metal detectors? Like, what, what are kind of some of the next steps for this work that you see as, as uh, pressing? Uh, well, thank you for that very open-ended question. Um, when I look over the beach, I see um, data and society. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to be as self-serving a question, <laughs> but thank you. No, and AI now, and you know, and, and 
other, other uh, on the ground, existing, functioning, flourishing uh, collective efforts to contend with um, how do we study this phenomenon? Uh, and um, thank goodness they're there. And uh, so <laughs> I would take my cue from what questions are being asked, like what your, what your work is about, Manny, and what Noelle's work will be about uh, now that she's in the belly of the beast fully. <laughs> um, and what Aridi is working on. I mean, I, I'm really, a, I really am a onlooker at this point. And uh, I guess the first thing I would do is, is read all the things that I haven't read. I've read a lot, but there's just so much. And uh, out of a great swath of uh, reading existing um, types of things from sociologists, historians, anthropologists, um, you know, digital media people and so on and so on, try to figure out how to do something ethnographic with um, the world of digital media. Um, and I, I don't have a plan, um, it, but it's, it strikes me that that's, that's the challenge. How do you, how do you if this is not a village, <laughs> it's not a family, it's not a, a, a town, it, it's something different. And mm -hmm. how, how, do, how do we get access to the bigger picture, not the keyhole, but the bigger picture of what this means to people in their lives? Uh, I can, you know, I, and I'm sure, you know, you could imagine, uh, um, I mean, you could, you, I guess you could do all kinds of things. You could set up, set up an Amazon Turk questionnaire and get access to hordes of people from all over the world and ask them your questions and see what came back. That would be maybe worth, worth a try. Um, it's a little hard. It's, it's so, um, it's so deterioral, deterritorialized that a lot of the models for, you know, old fashioned field work don't apply. Um, although I have thought of um, take, taking as a starting place, taking a local to something that's, that is territorialized like nextdoor.com or patch or, or one of the uh, social media platforms that sort of stays within the same place. Although I'm not even sure that's relevant anymore. Um, it's just, it's a, a reflex that, you know, old fashioned anthropology Make, makes you have. Um, so I've been tossing these ideas around and I, I don't have much to offer. It's just, there has to be a way to, to do this. I'm eager to hear what you think, all of you. Do we, do we collectively amongst us have, have uh, thoughts about where this is going? I mean, one thing I take away from your book, Emily, is like to look for the social wherever it can be found, that it's never not there. Mm -hmm. um, and to try and try and locate it. I mean, my work took into like the labs of the people who are writing specific algorithms that are used. There's sociality there, just like there's sociality yeah. in, in the lab. Um, I know that Ireti is looking at uh, how these, how these um, clinical models are being operationalized to try and diagnose people or build digital phenotypes at a distance. I'd love to uh, hear you talk about that. Ireti, Noel, you looked like you were going to uh, I, uh, identify one of these species crawling on the beach as well. Um, no, if you don't want to jump in, uh, I think Manny was actually going to ask me a question about digital phenotyping um, and how at least I'm thinking about it. Um, and definitely after reading this book, my, think, my thought process has changed a little bit um, because it's clear that there's kind of like this similar logic that goes into both the clinical diagnostic um, experience and also the machine learning uh, automated portion of it. Um, so in looking at that connection between those two portions um, among endeavors to like determine and analyze digital biomarkers for like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or depression and anxiety, um, seeing those as connected to the practices of the experimental psychology lab um, kind of points out that, well, it points out two things. Um, the first thing is that you point out that the, the, the experiments have to be structured in this particular way because its aim is to find universal truth. So I wonder how much 
this logic is ill-equipped to understand like spectrums of impairment um, mm -hmm. in autism, for example, but also um, in depression and anxiety, um, as well as other, you know, ranges of subjective experience. And there's like this whole host of subjective judgments underlying what constitutes impairment, for example, um, and then also what to do with those detections of impairment. Mm -hmm. um, so I honestly think that that's another direction to go is um, as we continue to see development in terms of um, just cognitive behavioral analysis online, like you have suggested and like anthropologists would always do, um, making sure to attend to um, those like individual differences and um, just like the experience of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. I, I feel like we could have like a, a half semester course on that topic uh, with Emily involved, given like her history of scholarship in this field. Um, uh, we only have a few more minutes. I do want to get some Q and A in. So, uh, Noelle, though you unmuted, uh, if you'll allow me, I'll no, ask go ahead. Else. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, great. Um, so, um, yes, uh, Allegra Fonda Bernardi asks. Um, well, she asks a question I'm a little bit curious about as well. When when the um, people you were working with um, insisted that you not make them look bad, uh, Allegra asks, to whom were you not to make them look bad? Funders, the publics, their peers? Um, who do you think these interlocutors were most concerned about appearing not bad to? Oh, is that different than good? I'll just add, you're supposed to make them look good or just not bad? Just not make them look bad was the only thing I was ever told, but what a great question, thank you. Um, I, I don't know, I didn't have the wit to, uh, I felt frightened by this um, edict. I wasn't sure quite what it meant. Uh, and I, I didn't come back um, to that question with like, what do you mean, <laughs> look bad where? Uh, but I, I was, I realized now I was assuming, perhaps wrongly, that I'm, I, I would bet on it that what they were most worried about is public, um, a, a devaluing of the field by the public some in, in some general sense. If I were to like write a tell all for uh, the tabloid press and, and the worst in their imagination would be that I would play up mistakes they had made uh, or messed up experiments or something like that would be their worst fear. That was never anything I was even the slightest interested in. So that wasn't a real, I mean, that wasn't a real threat. threat. But um, even as it stands with all my effort not to make them look bad, it could have another effect they would be worried about, which is making the discipline look less scientific. Um, and I mean, of course, that's such a broad, hairy edge, with hairy edges around it and all, we all know that. Um, but still, when you start saying it's all social through and through from the top to the bottom, it's not, it's, you know, the objective is, the, that which is objective is a, an ideal that uh, <laughs> is reached through many um, touchings of, this, of the subjective or something, however you want to put it. Um, so it could make things look less scientific. And what they really care about is grant money, of course. And to get grant money, mostly it means NIH or NSF, which are famously uh, you know, wedded to the traditional idea of science as the, the search for objective fact. So I think that was the deepest worry. Um, also, it's a, field, it's a field that has had some really terrible scandals um, and some horrific has, had to experience some of their members doing kind of horrific, abusive things. So there, there's a sensitivity there for, for, for that kind of reason. Um, my, my feeling about it was nothing I ever write is gonna become so well known that it would have an impact anyway, so don't worry about it. <laughs> and that is still, I still feel that's true. I mean, it's an academic book. It's, it's, it's pretty academic. <laughs> And so that protects it from being, uh, becoming, a, you know, something some congressman might pick up. I highly doubt that that would ever happen. I shouldn't, well, maybe Jamie Raskin, like my, my hero, might pick it up. <laughs> there, are, there are 
30 people attending this call. So, I mean, word's getting out there, uh, but I don't, I don't see any elected uh, representatives um, in the attendees list. Um, we are getting very close to time. Um, I wanna try and squeeze in one more question, if you'll allow me, uh, short and uh, quick answer um, for, to the question from Hee-Wong Kim. Um, briefly, um, they're asking, um, if there are other places you saw the histories of social media and online spaces inter intersecting with um, clinical psychology, maybe beyond the BJ Fogg instance you recommended, like, are, were there other pieces that came together to, for you to bring these topics together? Um, no, uh, hard to say. Um, certainly the material in the BJ Fogg book is all over the place. I mean, it's widely disseminated. And so it, it, there, it would be readily available for many people to pick up. Um, and I have not tried to pursue that question, but I think it's a very interesting one. And well, um, uh, because that course has been offered slightly, not a, not a, I, I mean, I don't know the standard system, but it's, it's not a regular, he's not a regular faculty member. He's like an adjunct or some, special um, kind of an instructor, but that course has been offered and offered and offered and offered over all these years. So yeah, that would be, there's a field work project, figure out who all has taken that course. Well, well, that question was asked by a current graduate student. So maybe if they're in the proposal stage, um, <laughs> they can use that. that. Totally fascinating. And, and, and interviewing some of the people that passed through that, um, you know, portal. But thanks for the question. Awesome. Um, we are. We have just a couple minutes left. Thank you so much um, to the entire panel uh, for being part of this. Thank you so much, Emily, for writing this book and for uh, gracing us with your presence today. Um, I want to give the last two minutes to you, though, if you have any final thoughts for us, um, other than saying everybody should run out and buy, uh, <laughs> buy the book. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Well, my only wish is to thank the panelists and the organizers from the heart. This was very enlightening to me and and kind of inspiring to maybe even keep going i mean <laughs> uh it's daunting this world that you all are living in more fully than i am and it's um but but i have a feeling maybe there are portals like harry potter's not the platform nine and a half um that you could sneak down and get into some real life or grounded sort of insights. So I feel encouraged and I thank you very much for that. Uh, it's, it's a lonely process, as you all know, writing a book and, and not knowing really who might ever read it. So it's enormously gratifying to me that this particular um, group, Data and Society, that I admire so much and have learned so much from has um, chosen to spend a morning um, talking about the book. I'm hugely appreciative. And to the panelists, it goes without saying, thank you from the heart. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, with that, I'm going to close uh, this edition of Data and Society's Book Forum series, which provides a platform for scholars and researchers to present their work, frame key debates in the field, and gather feedback from a community of interdisciplinary thinkers like you all at home and like you on the call. Thank you so much. Thank you.